You guys can open Romans 8, and this is going to be my last Romans message here. Uh, obviously not finishing the letter, but I am in Romans 8 in my study, and it's my favorite, probably my favorite section in the in the letter, and so it's appropriate to end on this note. Uh, next week I'll have some other things to say from elsewhere in Scripture, but Romans 8 this morning. And I'm going to call the message, God's Invincible Love. That's what I see being displayed here, especially as you get toward the end of the chapter. But we'll start with, with 828, which is probably one of the most well-known verses in all the Bible, maybe aside from John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Aside from John 3.16, Romans 8.28 is probably one of the most well-known and one of the most often quoted, where it says, we know that God works all things together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So that familiar verse, but it's all leading up to this overwhelming emphasis toward the end of the chapter of God's amazing love for us. And so we're going to see three things this morning. If you're looking for an outline, here's the outline. Uh, God's invincible love in our circumstances, look at that first, and then God's invincible love and our standing, and then in God's invincible love and our security, which is basically the end of the chapter. Starting off with our, our circumstances, and let me just read 8, 28, and 29, okay? It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. As I said, Romans 8.28 is, is quoted often among Christians, and you've probably quoted it. Maybe you've quoted it to yourself or to someone else, or someone else has quoted it to you. We hear it a lot, and we think about it a lot. And, and I think we could say Romans 8.28 is one of the verses that in a sense, is almost often misused. And here's what I mean. It can, be, it can be thrown around. It can be sort of glibly quoted to people who are going through a hard time in a very insensitive way. Kind of like, well, yeah, you know, life's difficult for you right now. But just remember, God works all things together for good. So this is one of those verses that can be unhelpful if, if spoken from an insensitive person or someone who's removed from what you're really going through, not able to sympathize with what you're going through. It can be incredibly unhelpful if not spoken with the right spirit. On the other hand, it's one of the most helpful verses in the Bible in terms of giving us a truth to anchor us. So if you were with us in recent weeks, we've been talking about in the beginning of chapter 8, Paul he begins with the idea that we're, we're under this no condemnation status, and then he goes into the section we're in right before here where he's talking about, I think it was two weeks ago, we were in this section where he's talking about creation groaning, the, the, the inevitable suffering of life in this world. And so he talked about creation groaning, and I actually, uh, I, the word groaning comes three times in that section, so I used those as my outline for my sermon a few weeks ago because it's like groaning, groaning, groaning. It's creation groaning, and then it's we groan within ourselves, and then it's the idea of the Spirit groaning as He intercedes for us. He intercedes with these groanings. And, and we said that that's all, and, and this is what I love about how Scripture just drops these truth bombs, just speaking truth, not sugarcoating. Look, life in this world is characterized by suffering, hardship. Creation itself is, is in turmoil. And then our, our physical bodies and our spirits within our bodies, we're in turmoil. And, and even the Spirit, as God, His presence with us through the Spirit, is going through things with us and is interceding for us with these groanings. This is all speaking of this life experience, which is even as I prayed earlier, it's a mix. There, there, there are times where things are light and burden-free, and there are times where things feel very burdensome and frustrating and scary or irritating or, you know, you name it. I mean, it's hard. Life is hard. I got a phone call, not this past week, but the week before from a friend that I've known since we moved up here. Uh, and she called and said, Jeff, um, and she was crying 
and she said, I need your help. I, I want you to officiate the memorial service for my son, Sam, who was killed in a motorcycle accident. And it had been, I think, one day from the time that that happened to when she called me. And uh, so her son, I, I knew him as a, as a young guy. When, when we moved up here, he was probably early teens, maybe younger than that. Uh, motorcycle accident, age of 25, passed away. The truthfulness of God works all things together for good is true. It's absolutely true. When you're going through something like that, does it feel true? Does it seem good? No. In the sense of this passage is God communicating with us about the way life really is and how things, hey, look, things are falling. That's the, the world we live in. Tragedies happen, and they happen on the level of what I just shared. They happen on lesser levels that life is filled with those types of experiences, and none of us want them. And, and it's kind of ironic to call this message God's invincible love when it's like, well, if, if God really loved me that much, then he wouldn't let me go through stuff like that. He wouldn't let things go so wrong. But what this passage reassures us of is that God has higher purposes. That's why it says that he causes all things to work together for good. Those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose, that he has this word purpose, speaks of him having for us a specific intended place or position. It's, it's his plan. He has a plan. And in his plan, everything works together for good. Everything, even the things, and this is what we need to hear at most, the things that to us don't seem to be good. And I, I think God would say to us, look, I, I know it's hard to believe this is good. But it's good. And someday you'll see that clearly. For, for now, you don't, but someday you will, but it is good. And so it says we know, we have this, this confidence that God, he, he is causing, or He is working together, literally. He's working together all things. Things that go ways that we would want them to go, things that do not go the way we would want them to go. He, all of them, He is causing to work together for good, for those who love God. Those who are awakened to the goodness of God, the value of God, as, as we have been to those who are called according to his purpose, that we know our life is, is placed specifically, intentionally by God, and he is the author of our story, and all the details he is sovereign over and is intending good in and through. And there is comfort in that. And as I said, it, it's, it's unfortunate when people quote this in a way that's unhelpful or insensitive, but... It can be incredibly helpful in the appropriate time to hear this, whether just in our own study or someone else saying it or us saying it to someone else. Just the reminder that, yeah, God is good and his purposes are good. And I don't, I don't always understand them. I don't have to understand them, but, but it's good. And then he kind of elaborates more in verse 29 when it comes to his love for us in our circumstances and what we go through. There's this idea also of what part of the good is, at least part of it, is that we are being conformed to the image of his son. It says, those whom he foreknew, those with whom he predetermined to have a relationship. He also called, or sorry, I just jumped ahead. Verse uh, That's in verse 30. I'm still in 29. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So, so he's got this predetermined purpose that we would be conformed to, to the image of Christ. And, and I, I used to think of this in terms of like uh, if you have a, a block of a stone that you want to carve. And, and so there's the likeness of Jesus and God is sort of chipping and chiseling that stone to make us look like Jesus. But the, the word literally means formed with. And so it has this idea of vital union or connection. It's formed with Christ. He is predetermined to, to form us with Christ. To You could maybe use the word merged, to, to merge us with Christ. Remembering the context of the suffering of creation, the suffering of us as individuals, those difficult things. 
God is up to good in all of them, and a part of that, a big part of that is, is forming us with Christ, is causing us to experience in reality what he has said to be true in terms of our relationship with him, that we are, we are bound to Jesus, that we experience in a very real sense, his death and his resurrection. We experience losses in life just like he experienced losses in life and we experience them with him. We are not alone in those losses or in those hardships or in that suffering. He, he is with us. We are secure in that place. And, and because it uses the word image, I mean, that's the idea of a likeness. And I, I believe... If I recall correctly, that's the same word when, when Jesus, remember when the disciples were they're asking about taxation and he said, Who's, whose likeness is on the coin? And this is Caesar. And so if you think of a coin and the likeness in today, of course, we have, which we never use anymore, right? Who needs change anymore? But uh, when you once in a while, on a rare occasion, you see a coin and you see the likeness of a president on it. So it's the same idea. It's like a representation of that person. And so we know Jesus is the image of God. He's the likeness of God, the representative of God in this world. And he's saying, we are being conformed to the image of God's son. We are being formed with the image of Christ, which says that there is something about the reflection of that, what's happening as God carries us into and through trials and difficulties and suffering in this fallen world is that he is causing us to experience more deeply that intimacy of union with Christ. And there is a reflection of that. There is a, a likeness that we share his likeness so that he would be, it says, the firstborn among many brethren, so that he has, even as he called his disciples, no longer do I call you slaves, but brothers. So that we are in this familial union with Christ, and you can get caught up with, and we talked about this in Sunday school, you, you can get preoccupied with this idea because in our humanness we, we want to go to the list of do's and don'ts and how our life is supposed to look. And uh, sometimes people cite Romans 8.29 as, well, this is part of what you need to do to obey the, the rules or do whatever so that you might look like Jesus. And, and it's like, there's what he looks like and you're, you know, God's helping you, but you're kind of making yourself look like him. This is, this is not that, this is much deeper than that. This is the idea of, of union with him and then a reflection of that union. This is what for those who weren't with us in Sunday school, you could go back and watch the video, but what we talked about in Sunday school regarding the revealing of God's glory to Moses. And remember Moses, when he's up with God and God passes by and then he comes down from the mountain. You remember what was happening to Moses' face? What was his face doing? He was shining, right? It was, Paul just went like that. It was emitting this, this light that was a reflection of him seeing the, something of the glory of God. Well, you get to the New Testament, you get this idea that through Jesus, God reveals his glory to us, the glory of his love to us. And then, as with Moses, so also with us, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, beholding the glory of the Lord in the face of Jesus, contextually, that's what he's saying, in the face of Jesus Christ, he says we are conformed to the same image, from one degree of glory to another, we somehow, we don't have to determine it, we don't control it, we don't have to make, but just in some way, and God's working in and through our lives as he carries us into and through suffering and sustains us and conforms us to the image of his son, there is this reflection that he's causing to where beholding the glory of the Lord, we're transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. God just causes his people to reflect that very same glory, the glory of his love. And maybe maybe that's why I uh, fell apart earlier, because as I think back of our over our time here, 15 years here, like the reality of God's love has been manifest to us through people in this church. You know, we have we have served as a family and, and isn't it like God to work this way to where, yeah, we have served, we have poured out, and yet we feel like the recipients. We feel like we've benefited from God's love through people. And so I think that's something of what he's describing here. As you go through life together and 
God keeps you and carries you through. There is a this familial reflection that takes place as we are conformed to the image of Christ. And it doesn't necessarily always mean everything's pristine on the outside or kind of like the, you know, the legalistic or moralistic category is not always, it can be real messy, it can be real sloppy, but but God's invincible love is manifest because it's God working in and through people that are formed with Christ, that are united vitally with Christ, and he just He does that. And so even that is a manifestation of God's love. He is the source. And so he says, this is what he's up to. And then verse 30, these whom he predestined, he called, and these whom he called, he justified, and these whom he justified, he glorified. And this is the idea of God's invincible love. And our standing, and I use that word standing because it's like this idea of a standing in relationship. So you know you know what it feels like. One of the things that we're facing as we head back there, we have some family there, we have some friendships there, but not to the same depth that we have here. And, and one of the things that I know the girls are feeling is that, you know, you're going to meet new people, and they don't say it this way, but there's insecurity, right? And, and you know this, you you meet someone new or, or you're coming into a new church, for example, and maybe some of you are newer here, uh, you, you're coming into a new setting with new people. There's an insecurity about that, isn't there? Because you know humans are uh, judgmental. Humans are fickle in terms of they like you one minute, they don't the next. Humans can be, they used to say in seminary, you're a shepherd and don't, don't forget, sheep can bite, so you're going to be bitten sometimes. They used to say that, so, so people bite, right? The, there's this insecurity because in relationship with people, it's just, there's no guarantee that it's permanent. You know, you know it can end. You, you know your standing with a person can end depending upon your performance. You, you can disqualify yourself from a person's favor, right? And and it goes all directions. You can disqualify yourself from my favor and I can disqualify myself from your favor. We all have our limits, don't we? Well, here, Paul, people, you know, have lots of theological debates about all these things. But in the context of the groaning of this world and the groaning of ourselves individually and the groaning of the interceding spirit. This is all meant to be encouragement and reassuring. And there's this section here in verse 30 where it's referred to by theologians as the, the unbreakable chain of salvation. And it is that. And, and people debate even the order of salvation. But this is really meant to be reassuring that those whom, you could, you could translate it this way, the same ones he predestined, he called, and the same ones he called, he justified, and the same ones he justified, he glorified. Which is a way of saying, by contrast with human relationships, this one is absolutely guaranteed. Your standing with God is invincible. It's unconditional in Christ. It's already established. It's, you, you're predestined. It's predetermined. You're called, and that's the what theologians call the effectual call of God. God awakened you. He called you to Christ. He revealed himself in the glory of his love and forgiveness and mercy and whatever took place in your mind when salvation happened. He, he called you. And the same ones he called says he also justified so that everything, and, and this is going to come up later, but he, he declared you right, that everything, and, and is this hard to believe? This is, this is more analogy than anything, but the Pierce family, we like to keep things buttoned up. We like to be tired. I have my shirt untucked this morning, and even this feels awkward for me. We're so like up to everything is, right? And our house is in complete shambles right now. And everything is upside down and topsy turvy, and we wanted to have this done and that, and it's not done, and it's not. We don't have our arms around stuff, and and I know Jill senses this, and I feel this because we both said, "Oh, we should have started sooner. We should have done this. We should have done that." And like, so our very righteousness seems at stake in that we're, we didn't do it the right way. 
We seem like we're way far from Romans 8, but we're going to come back. We're coming back to Romans 8 right now because this is saying the voice that matters most, the voice of God says, hey, it's all right. You're right. You're righteous. Not righteous because inherently you're righteous. You're not righteous because you do everything right because you don't. You're not righteous because you relate to God rightly because you don't. You're not right, righteous because you relate to other people rightly because you don't often. You're righteous because I say you're right. Predestined you, called you, justified you, and, and this is fascinating too, and glorified you. And that's mysterious because it's past tense, glorified with an ED at the end, but it's like, well, I thought glorification comes later. Well, it does in our experience, but it's as good as done from God's perspective. Your standing is completely secured for you it's complete for you so it's, it's as good as done and that too is good to know because it doesn't feel all that glorious all the time down here does it but god says this is true it's like a to z in the relationship the standing is secure it's all it's all good it's all taken care of this invincible love and we're, we're building to that where he explicitly is going to talk about that. But that's what that's the tone of this whole passage is God's love. So let's talk now about God's invincible love and our, and our ultimate security. And there are just different examples or illustrations of what we are secure from. And just read. Let's just read from verse 31 to the end of the chapter. And I'll say a little bit about it, but it really speaks for itself here. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you're really studious and you're saying, well, I don't, the word love doesn't even come up, the whole section we've been, but then you get to this section and I'll prove it to you. I'll justify myself for a second. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 35. Verse 37. All these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. That's verse 37. Verse 39. Nothing can separate us. Height, depth, any created thing. Nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So do you see how this is all pointing toward that love of God for you? His surrounding love, his invincible love. Who can be against us? What allegation? I mean, if God's for you, who can be against you? If he gave you his son, is he going to give you everything else you need? So let's pause here for a moment. I mean, what is it that you feel like you need right now? I'm guessing there's something. You feel like you need in your in your marriage, feel like you need from your kids, feel like you need in your circumstances, feel like you need in your checkbook, feel like you need at your job or I don't know. What what do you feel like you need? And and what's underneath what you think you need? What 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 are you where are you craving security or, or craving contentment or, or craving comfort or craving freedom? And he says, look, look at 
Christ on the cross. Look at my son given for you. If I, if I didn't spare the most valuable treasure to the Father is the Son, and if I didn't spare him, won't I give you everything else you need to? What, what, at, at what risk are you? What insecurity is there really, if that's true? Who's going to bring a charge against you? And as he said earlier in the unbreakable chain of salvation earlier in verse 30, he comes back to this idea of justification. Hey, if God says you're right and righteous, then who's going to condemn you? Don't raise your hand, but, and this is why I gave the illustration earlier of what we're going through in our household, but I mean, do you find yourself condemning yourself? Beating yourself down? Shoulda, coulda, woulda. I've said it many times over the years here, but it's always a, a mix of both condemning ourselves and condemning other people. Sometimes we're more condemning of others. Sometimes we're more condemning of ourselves. But that's normal human internal monologue. And maybe you have heard condemnation from someone else, someone else who is attacking you and accusing you in one way or another and I just the other day had a conversation with someone and I got this sense and I, I want to be careful because I'm not omniscient, but the sense that I got, and you, you ever had this sense when you're having a conversation with somebody where you can kind of tell they're trying to justify themselves or saying, well, they're trying to either make excuses for some way they blew it or, and, and maybe, you know, I, I find myself doing that or you're trying to prove that, well, I'm, you know, it may seem to you like I'm not working hard, but I'm really working hard in my life. So let me tell you about all the things I've been busy doing. Like you're trying to justify yourself. You know what I'm talking about? Or someone else, they're like over the top. It's extreme and you can tell this person like relax a little bit. You're trying to justify it. You don't have to do that. Or they're telling you all about their career, their job title, and they're just going on and on and on. It's like, whoa, easy there, killer. It's like they got to they gotta prove to you something, who they are, how important they are. It's like, what, what is, where, why does that happen in this world? Why do we do that? It's because we're trying to justify ourselves and there's this inner voice of accusation. We're trying to compensate or overcome it. And he says here, look, who's going to accuse you? If God says you're mine and you're righteous and it's covered, who else matters? Who else's opinion matters? For one thing, they're just as crazy as you are. They don't really know you like they think they do. You don't even know yourself. Clearly. But the one true judge, the just judge of all the earth, has in Christ declared you righteous. Isn't that a relief? And he says, So who's going to accuse you? God's justified you. His life is righteous. He died, was raised, he's at the right hand of God. He stands as your substitute, and he even intercedes for you. That's why he also, so with the Spirit earlier is interceding for you. Christ is interceding for you. You have the Father's love for you. You have the Spirit interceding for you. You have Jesus at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. You are caught in this web of love. This invincible love. So who will separate us? And in one sense, you could translate what will separate us from the love of Christ because he goes on to say, well, tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or high gas prices. Or whatever else you can think of. Will anything in your earthly experience separate you from the love of God? No. And this is where we get the idea of um, how this all takes place, just as is written, verse 36, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. Again, not sugarcoating things. Look, life is often like a death march. It is sometimes. It's, it's, it's exhausting. It's frustrating there's conflict and tension and th there's that in your in the individual and in small scale grand scale if we're not stressed out about fighting with someone in our household we're stressed out about 
fighting with people virtually online or on the road or what it's just this melee and this, it just feels like there's this death march going on or as he says here we're like sheep led to slaughter and he could be talking about I don't know from a ministerial experience standpoint in Paul's own life or in general this idea that the curse just gets everybody. The stuff that he just listed, the tribulation, distress, and persecution, and famine, nakedness, peril, sore, I mean, gets everybody at some point. The curse gets all of us, and that's inevitable, but we are, verse 37, conquerors still through him who loved us. We overcome, not because of anything innate to us, but because of the one who loved us. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life, neither death itself nor life itself, or anything that occurs in life or in death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers. And we'll pause there. Don just wrapped up a series on God, Satan, and demons. And we talked a lot about the spiritual warfare and the way we tend to think about that and view it as if there's this cosmic tug of war going on, and if we pray hard enough, then God wins. If we don't, then Satan wins. And this back and forth kind of misperception of things or misunderstanding of things when the scripture paints this picture that God is, is completely sovereign over all of that, and there's nothing that any, even Satan himself, nor his demonic forces, nothing that any principality of power, whether it's of the other world, the, the unseen, or the seen world of politicians and power brokers and the, I want to say some names of these, you know, these powerful figures, which I often do, but I'm not going to do it this morning. But you know, the powerful people that you hear about that you're just so sick of hearing about that seem to be pulling the strings of the world right now. Like, is any of them going to be able to do anything successfully that God doesn't let them do? Are any of them going to be able to remove you or me from the love of God in Christ? I says no. Is anyone going to come along who can do that? No, because nor things to come either. Or nor people to come. Nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. No created thing. And as, as Don highlighted in that series, that Satan himself is a created thing. So even lest we go down those paths of losing sight of who, who's the big boy in the room. Who's the Alpha? There's one. And it's the Alpha and the Omega. Not just the Alpha. It's the Alpha and the Omega. Like everything. Really, really big. And he loves you. And he says you're secure in his love. And that's invincible. He covers literally every category you could think of. It says you're secure in the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I'll close with, with this thought. Psalm 139, some of you may know it well, where it speaks of God's surrounding us and his, his knowledge of us and where can I go from your presence? You know that psalm? If I go here, you're there. If I go there, you're there. If I rise up, lie down. And it's kind of like stressing in some ways the locational presence of God or, or geographical presence of God and the knowledge of God for sure. And as we come to Romans 8, it's a similar way of understanding God surrounding us. And here it oozes with the love of God and not only like a locational or geographical presence, but a relational, intimate presence even circumstantial presence with us, surrounding us, working all things together for good. And that is, uh, that's an anchor for us. And so as you look down the path of what is before you, I don't know what your life has in front of you, what our lives have in front of us, may God continue to help us to see and believe that he loves us with this invincible love, that he has everything taken care of, 
that anything that can happen to us in this world, it, it, it can only happen as it's allowed to happen, it can only happen according to his good purpose, his good design. And even when the worst, even when it comes to an end, even when death itself occurs, still safe in his love, assured of resurrection life. You can't lose because God has saved us and he's brought us into relationship with himself and he keeps us and he has uh, established this permanent, this permanent relationship in Christ. And that's good news and you're not going to hear it out there in the world. It's a foreign message. It's the gospel. It's the good news. Hope it's encouraging to you. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the time this morning. Thank you for the truth of the letter of Romans and how you've recorded here realities related to our condition and our need and our both our weakness and our sinfulness and rebellion. How we have countless ways by which we wander from you and we we do that because underneath it all we by nature fail to to value you, to see your worth. And you could have left us to ourselves and you could have given us what we deserve, but you didn't. You came for us. You loved us with an invincible love. You've secured us in Christ and we're thankful for that. So help us to see and be amazed by your provisions in the day-to-day -day and trust that even as we face the, the next day, what's in front of us, which we can't foresee, help us to trust that you're with us and that this invincible love is truly surrounding us. And we thank you for what you've revealed through your word and through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.